Hey you folks, Quillington here, and welcome to a new Let's Fly episode. I've decided as long as I'm continuing to be addicted to flight simulators, I may as well record some of these flights. I'm still, of course, very, very much learning, but today I want to take this opportunity to give you guys a flyover of one of my very favorite places in the entire world. Um, now, one of the things with the flight simulator is there seems to be a lot of really excellent content for Europe, and there seems to be a lot of really good excellent content for some parts of the United States. For example, uh, there's one company that makes really great uh, landscape terrain for uh, pretty much the entirety of the UK and also the western coast of, um, of the United States, and uh, kind of creeping up into sort of British Columbia on the west coast of Canada there, but there doesn't seem to be much around where I am, which is a bit of a shame because uh, I do want to highlight the area that we're going to fly over, and unfortunately, it's not going to do it justice. It is a, uh, a nice fall day. It's about 16 degrees Celsius today, so relatively warmish. Uh, I think I've got the simulator set to somewhere around late September right now. Uh, some of the leaves may have changed colors. I actually don't know if uh, the simulator does that or not, but we are currently parked in Gore Bay at the Gore Bay Manitoulin Airport. Let me just go ahead and hit a little pause on the simulator over here and bring over the map which is the reason we do have the, the title bar visible. Unfortunately, uh, Prepared, or Prepare 3D, which is a flight simulator I'm using, which is basically Flight Simulator X, but the next version of it. Unfortunately, it doesn't do like a borderless full screen or, or anything like that. So you either have to do full screen mode, in which case I can't get to my second monitor, or we've got to get the little title bar in there. Um, but it lets me sort of uh, flip through some views over here. So let me do a quick little explanation of where I live. So I live in Canada and I live in Ontario. Now, for most people in Canada, uh, Ontario means this area over here, which is out of the population of Ontario, which is somewhere in the, I don't know, 10 to 15 million or something like that. All, nearly half of all Canadians, I think, live in, in Ontario. Maybe it's about 10 million or some. I, I'm not sure. But something like 95% 90 of Ontarians live in southern Ontario, which is, this is Toronto over here. We've got, uh, I think that's Ottawa? Ottawa over here. And this whole area around here is very, very built up. So most people who live in Ontario live there. However, Ontario is extremely, extremely big. If we zoom out to around here, you can see Southern Ontario, where almost everyone in Ontario lives. And then you've got all of this is the rest of Ontario. This is the area considered to be Northern Ontario. This would be sort of Northeastern Ontario, Northwestern Ontario, and the far north over there. So I live in Northern Ontario, but not super, super far north. I live in, um, hang on, I'm getting, I'm disorienting myself. Uh, where am I? Oh, derp, over here. I'm like bodies of water, things. I live over here. Boy, we got a big pink line showing everything. I live over here in Sudbury, which is, uh, I think the largest city in Northern Ontario at a whopping 150,000 people, which is not too terribly big. But my very favorite place in the entire world probably is Manitoulin Island, which is right over here. Manitoulin Island is the largest freshwater island in the world. That is to say an island in a lake as opposed to a lion, uh, an island in the ocean. I guess the biggest island in the ocean might be something like Greenland, although honestly it should probably be considered a continent. But uh, there we go. So it is very, very cool. Um, it is beautiful. It's got a lot of farming, a lot of great wilderness on it, and not a whole lot of people. Despite being uh, the largest island, the largest freshwater island in the world, I think it's maybe about 80 miles long somewhere around 100 kilometers long from tip to tip, uh, depending on whether you count Coburn Island or not. Uh, I think it's only got about 10,000 people that live on it, if that. The largest town on the island is Little Current over here, which is a population of just over 1,000 people. Um, and yeah, so it is great, it is beautiful, it is quaint, it's great. I just love it so much. Uh, going from Sudbury, you would get there by driving down Highway 17, which is right over here. That's known as the Trans-Canada Highway, because it literally goes from tip to tip of Canada. You can drive the entire width of Canada along Highway 17. It would probably take you six or seven or eight days, or maybe longer, I'm not sure. Um, I, don't, I don't know how many people ever try to do it. Uh, so there we've got that. And then uh, when you get to around Macare, which is a microscopic little village, uh, you'd turn south on, I think this is Highway six? I don't get the highway markings on this map. Go through Espanola, through the Lacloche Mountains, which we're going to be talking about relatively soon, over onto Great Lacloche Island, into Little Current, and it's not present in the flight simulator, which is a shame, but there's a kick-ass bridge um, right over here, kick-ass like rotating swing bridge thing uh, to let boats through, and it's beautiful and interesting and great, and everyone who ever comes to the Little Current takes pictures of it because it's sort of the highlight of things. We're going to start in Gore Bay, which is actually not a place I go to quite as often, um, but uh, it's got a population about 
800 people, I think, and it's got an, uh, an airport. There's another airport right over here, the Manitoulin Eastern Airport, um, but I figured I'd start in Gore Bay. Um, so, and I'll talk about more about what makes Manitoulin Island special once we're actually in flight. This video is going to be mostly about uh, geography more than the actual flight. Uh, the flight plan for today is I will take off and I will head um, due east, probably magnetic 90. So basically eastward um, over this way. Um, so that way I can pass over the little current and then we're going to turn towards Sudbury Airport at this point. This is the actual, this is Sudbury proper, uh, but the airport is out over here. Uh, we're going to be, after we take off, I'm mostly just going to use the compass to fly uh, east, but I've uh, got my radios tuned to the uh, the nav beacon, the VOR for the Sudbury Airport over here, and we are going to be um, intercepting the 59 radial. What that means, um, and this is really old technology, but there's a big radio station over here that's putting out stuff, and you can tune your radio to it, and not only... Uh, from that, can you tell sort of the direction of the beacon, but it'll actually inform you through ancient, ancient magic, um, what sort of compass direction uh, you are relative to where you're going. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fly east until I hit the, uh, the 59, I'll show you on the thing, and then I'm going to turn going 59 degrees on my compass and fly straight towards the Sudbury Airport, and then we'll go and land. Um, we'll do that. Okay, so... That's our flight plan, so let's go ahead. I've got everything uh, prepped. The engine is active and warm on the um, uh, on the run up next to the uh, next to the runway over here. I am today flying. People have really recommended that I give this a try. Do I have shadows turned off? Derp. Oh well. I've been I've been messing a lot with my uh, performance settings, so uh, I will apologize ahead of time if there happens to be any sort of texture popping or whatever when we are in the air, especially since this is going to be a low altitude flight. I'm still sort of fine tuning a few things when I as I add mods. It's the reason I don't tend to mod games too heavily because you spend more time modding the game than you do actually playing it. It feels like sometimes. But this is the A2A Simulations uh, C172, basically the Cessna 172, but uh, without the uh, the trademark name. Um, and it is possibly the most precisely simulated plane uh, in any flight simulator. Um, certainly, I think to get anything more accurate than this, you'd have to potentially fly the real thing. Uh, if I bring up some of these pop-ups here, um, there's a maintenance hagger, which normally I can't use because right now my engine is running. But in here you can change your propellers, you can go in and, and tune the engine. Uh, each cylinder in the engine is simulated. It keeps track of whether your spark plugs are getting fouled up, all kinds of different things like that. It is, it is pr very, very, very accurately modeled. Um, and, I don't know, there's also great stuff about it. I'm going to stop sort of talking about it. Uh, one of the things I really like about it is you can toggle how you want your GPS. If you want the integrated one, if you want no GPS, or if you want the one that's just, like, stuck onto the window over here. I like flying with this one because it doesn't actually integrate into the rest of my systems. So I can't, um, I can't use the GPS course in here to point out things on my... Uh, my what would you call the, the VOR1 indicator, but I think it can tie into the GPS as well, nor can the um, autopilot take advantage of that, uh, which is uh, which I think is very cool. Um, so it's going to force me to just sort of pay attention to this and, and do more proper sort of VFR flying instead of, I usually, because it's a little easier, because looking around in the simulator is kind of a pain in the butt. Uh, one of the things I miss from playing X-Plane is the ability to hotkey uh, views to different areas, and I'm looking into a few different solutions for that, because I would like a hotkey that's, like, out the left window, but a little bit lower in viewpoint than one that's, like, sort of diagonally backwards, and then the same thing on the right, but I like my front view to be a little bit higher like this, so I can just sort of see over the, um, the dashboard properly. So I'm going to look into ways of doing that, but, um, but anyway, I'm going to try to do a little bit more sort of visual flying that way. I've been practicing a lot more of the basics, still have a lot to learn, uh, but we're there. So anyway, so having the GPS here, A, will allow me to point things out to you guys as we fly, um, which will be kind of fun, but um, I won't actually be relying on that. So I think I've got all my radios tuned. Um, I've got the ADF to a Sudbury ADF, but we're slightly out of range now. Same thing with the VR, we are out of range of this as well. Oh, what I have to do is set my course to say that we will want to follow the 59 radial over here. So what will happen at some point when we get into range, uh, this needle here, the vertical needle, will go off to one side because we actually will be off our 59 radial, but as we approach it, it'll be centered, and at that point I'll turn in that direction. I'm going to go ahead and just set this little heading bug here to east to remind myself that that's the direction I want to go, and push comes to shove, I can throw on the autopilot if I need to step away and go pee or something like that, or if there's a crash in, uh, in the recorder. So, um, although I suppose I could always pause. So I think with all that, we are completely ready to go. So we'll go ahead and um, let people know that uh, we're going to be 
taken off on runway 11. Um, yeah. There's going to be a slight crosswind. It's going to be coming somewhat from the right. So when we take off, we're going to be shoved a little to the left, which you always do a little bit just because I think engine torque. Um, so it's going to be a little bit worse than usual, but we'll be okay. Um, so we're going to let people know that we're just departing east. We don't, we don't have to taxi. We're already there. There's no, uh, there's no tower here, so we're just sort of letting other airplanes know that we're doing that. No one else has been oof, saying anything. That was a bit of a clunky rough start over there. Um, that's the other thing is I find looking for other airplanes is more of a pain in the ass in uh, the simulator than it might be in real life because like I can look out here but not really see it. I'd have to sort of duck a little bit and look up and angle and different things like that. So luckily if I die in the flight simulator I don't die in real life so it's not uh, too bad. Anyway we're straight up. We've got no flap set. We shouldn't need any for this takeoff at all. So I'm going to go ahead and throttle all the way up to max. We are in full rich. Yes, good. And we're going to take off at about uh, 55 knots. A little bit slow there. I'm going to pull up. And we're going to try to stay for around uh, 70 knots for the initial climb over here. I'm going to stay relatively low. The clouds uh, drop down to about 2,600 feet, uh, which is not terribly high. Um, so yeah, it'll be a relatively low flight. Plus, it'll be better for sightseeing as well. Um, all right, let me pick up a little bit of speed by nosing down. We're going to do our right turn, actually basically a 180 turn, uh, to start heading eastwards. Do, 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 do. So I'm using the uh, FTX Global um, Terrain Pack as well as FTX Vector. Uh, although I'm saying that and I'm realizing that I might actually have um, things set to Europe instead. Oh, we'll see how it goes. So we might, we might not get all the prettiness, but it'll still give me plenty of time to talk about it. Again, we're not, because there's not an actual specific pack for this area. Oh, I went too far. Too busy talking, not paying attention to my compass. Because there's not a specific um, um, landscape pack for this area here, it's not going to be 100% accurate. But it's not bad. Uh, so we're approaching 2,000 feet, and I think that's what I'm going to fly at. I know there's, like, different heights that are more or less appropriate for different reasons, but... Um, I think 2,000 feet is going to be a very comfortable height for us. Of course, I'm still climbing a little bit. I'm going to start to trim down as well here as I look for level flight. And then we'll talk a little bit more about what, we, uh, what we've we got here. Do, do, do. Nose down a little bit more while I also adjust the trim. Yeah, we're above where it's sort of intended to be. I'm still not great at locking into um, straight and level flight. I mean, the straight's not too bad, although it's a very calm day. Uh, I think the wind, which is coming from north-northwest, no, north, yeah, north-northwest, um, is uh, only 10 knots, which is not too much. Now, if I, we might be okay. I should actually throttle back a little bit more. We're a bit overdoing it on the RPMs, which is a little bit foolish for me to try to get into straight and level flight without my throttle set where I actually want it to be. Let's try that again. So yeah, as I said, it is the, uh, the largest freshwater island in the world. Uh, oh, by the way, the total flight time uh, will be about 40 minutes now that we're in the air, just to let you guys know. We might do a little bit of accelerated uh, flight at some point, um, but not too much, not until we leave Manitoulin. So in addition to the, uh, the small towns, and we're actually going to be passing over um, a few of them, we're going to be passing over a Kagwong soon, which is a really beautiful little town that's got this waterfall in it called the uh, Bridal Veil vale Falls. Um, and uh, what my favorite thing about the town, though, is it's got a little chocolate shop. They make their own, own chocolates. I think the town has a population like maybe 100 people, maybe a couple hundred people. It is minuscule. Great for boating, though. Good little dock. Uh, I got to trim up a little bit because I'm having to apply a little bit of back pressure to keep this level here. Um, but uh, and, and the thing is, it boasts one of like the oldest churches in, I don't know, on Manitoulin, certainly, but maybe on Ontario or something like that. And the church is like a whopping 100 years old or something like that. You have to remember, if you're a European watching this, Canada is exceptionally young compared to Europe. Now, there's certainly some more historical and older sites if you go into, um, especially into Quebec, where there was a lot of early colonization there. Um, you might find a few things that are a few hundred years old. But, you know, there's people in Europe Normal people in Europe who are living in houses that are older 
and basically my entire country, actually, depending on exactly when you consider the, uh, the birth of Canada to be. Still drooping a little bit here, still trying to adjust my trim. It's another thing I think would be actually a little bit more convenient in a real plane, because you can sort of just physically grab that wheel. There's a wheel down here, and when I'm trimming, it's just adjusting that, and it's just tweaking. There we go. I've let go of the control stick now, and we are going straight, and we're climbing a little bit, but that is pretty damn level. Um, the trim just tweaks where some of the control surfaces are, and um, we got to go a little bit to the right. And uh, means that you don't have to constantly hold the stick to hold the altitude if you set it right. So it takes me a long time to do, but I keep thinking in a real plane you could sort of like twist it around faster. You know, you've got a little bit more sort of brain power about like, okay, I need to make a big tr trim change so you can sort of swing it around a bit. And here I'm like, I'm holding down the button, but I have no, no physical feedback telling me how far I'm actually going. Um, other than how much I can sort of release the stick. Plus, in a real plane, you would be getting force feedback on your, uh, on your yoke is uh, this thing, um, telling you uh, sort of how much pressure is being applied to your plane. So little things like that. that some, certainly there's things in the simulator that are a hell of a lot easier, such as the ability to pause when you need to go pee. That's pretty nice. Or look up something important about uh, an airport or something like that. But uh, yeah, there's things. Anyway, um, what else? Oh, the next thing I want to talk about with Manitoulin is uh, it's actually the, uh, the geography is kind of interesting. Um, or the geology, I should say. It is the western tip of a piece of uh, terrain called the Niagara Escarpment, which uh, certainly goes through southern Ontario. Oh, there we go. That is letting me know that uh, the ADF, I had the audio on my ADF, and it's picking that up now. And actually, I'll probably get some of those beeps for the nav. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that off. The radio stations do actually broadcast some sounds that you can uh, listen to if you want. And I was using that. So this arrow here is actually pointing directly towards Sudbury. If I were to turn so that arrow was pointing directly north, and ignore the uh, the compass bit, that that's, has nothing to do with this. But if I was pointing, turning my plane so that the arrow was pointing directly forward, I'd be flying directly towards Sudbury, or at least directly towards that particular radio tower. And you can see here the, uh, the VOR indicator is now live, and um, I'm not on the radial yet. The radial if I were to be pointing directly, say, on 59, which is where I've got my course selection set, if I were pointing my plane towards 59, nothing would change here in terms of the antenna, but it would be quite clear that um, the signal, uh, the actual radial I want is to my right, which means I have to keep flying east, and at some point this will come into the middle. So yeah, there's Niagara Escarpment. Now, what I just found out about this piece of interesting geology, which I don't really know geology, so I can't really tell you much about it, but it actually goes... Um, after, after going through sorry, the Niagara region of uh, southern Ontario, and maybe poking into Quebec a little bit, it goes underground, but it continues straight through under the ocean and then pops up again in Europe somewhere. I'm going to have to, like, Wikipedia it again because I don't remember the actual facts, but it's like one continuous piece of geology that links uh, both continents, presumably from back when it was, like, Pangeified and things. Uh, but I thought that was kind of neat. Um, but yeah, it's actually got a pretty great landscape. Now, a lot of it is fairly flat as depicted here, but there are, um, there's not, there's not really hills on Manitoulin, but there are more like plateaus. And I guess, I mean, there's almost a hint of one over there. Uh, but they're, they're a little bit bigger and a little bit more interesting and certainly a lot more forest in real life than, uh, than I've got here. I don't have my, uh, my ground detail set all the way up as I try to keep tuning my performance and different things. Um, but there's one great area called the Cup and Saucer Trail, so named because the little plateau or the series of plateaus that this place is kind of looks like a cup on a saucer. Um, but it's a great little nature hike that you can take. Um, and you can go up a, like, sort of a cliff. I mean, you can walk up it. It's a very steep walk up, but you're not actually, like, mountain climbing or anything like that. And I think, I can't remember, I think it's about 100 meters up. I think it's about 300 feet. And then it's like cliffside where you can go and like stand on top of the cliff and look straight down. And it is beautiful. It is absolutely beautiful. But um, if you've got any sort of vertigo, you're not going to want to go right up to the edge. Um, the other thing about Manitoulin is there are quite a number of native reserves on it. Um, there we go. Oh, I forgot to talk about where Manitoulin actually is. It is in one of the Great Lakes. Uh, it's in uh, the, the Lake Huron. And I'm just remembering that because the Hurons is, of course, a name of a certain First Nations group. Um, and so on the south side, it's basically Lake Huron. On the sort of east side, it's called the Georgian Bay, which is really the same kind of overall body of water as Lake Huron. But because of some of the, the landscape, it forms a little bit of a bay there. It is pretty big. Georgian Bay is almost as big as a Great Lake by itself. Um, 
And then the north part of it, the part sort of here between the island and mainland Ontario, was considered the North Shore. Um, so yeah, so there was that. So there's a, there are a lot of native groups around here, and right very close we're going to be flying over an area called West Bay. Uh, and it used to be a town called West Bay, which was a native reserve, but uh, has now been renamed more appropriately. It's uh, it's Michigan. I'm not 100% on the pronunciation. It's M apostrophe C-H um, other things. Um, Michigan. Um, you pass through it on your way to Kaguan, between Kaguan and Little Current. I think it's Highway 540. But um, in the, uh, the eastern part of the island, I think right over here is... I could... Uh, let me let me pop this up actually, and flip that over this way, and then embiggen it. Can I not? Oh, there's no way to grab the uh, the corner over there. That's too bad. Well, hopefully it's it's clear enough. This area over here is called Wikwimikong. It's the largest unceded uh, native reserve in Canada, which is to say, the original treaty that formed the reserve, oh so very long ago. Um, they never gave up any land from that point forward, which a lot of other reserves have sort of been chipped away over time because of reasons. Um, and uh, it's a great place. They have a, a huge powwow there every summer. And I mean, all kinds of places have powwows, but uh, the Wikwimikon one is quite big, quite famous. And there are... I've been climbing very slow this whole time, which is not what my intention was. Let me go ahead and uh, just pitch down a little bit and just trim down a little bit as well. Um... And there are, like, native dancers and drummers and things that come from all over northern Ontario to compete there. Huge competition. It is open to the public. And uh, if you do find yourself in uh, on Manitoulin Island in August, specifically I think it's during the, uh, the long weekend in August, the so-called Civic Holiday in Canada, which is the most boring name for a vacation or a holiday ever, uh, I believe is when the Wikwimikong powwow goes. Uh, we usually refer to it as Wiki, uh, because Wikwimikong is apparently too many letters many syllables to say. All right, we are very slowly descending, which is kind of exactly what I'm going for over here. Um, right now, we are over the area of Manitoulin, known as Northeastern Manitoulin and the Islands. It is a, that is the municipality. So while Little Current is technically the largest town or hamlet, or I don't know what you'd call it, um, on Manitoulin, uh, it doesn't. It's not actually its own municipality. It may have been at one point. It might have had its own councillors and mayors or reeves or whatever. Um, but uh, some time ago, a lot of these little towns um, amalgamated into a larger municipal body, simply known as Northeastern Manitoulin and the Island, or NEMI. So lots of farming on the island. Um, it's not because it's very rocky. It's not really terribly well suited to that many crops. In some places, it is, and you know, certainly there's uh, some people grow corn. On, on the island, but a lot of cattle uh, farming or ranching, I suppose. I guess you don't farm cows, you ranch them or something. Uh, I am going ahead and uh, very slowly turning to the left here because we're coming very close to um, hitting our, our radial. As far away as we are from Sudbury, it's not going to move very quickly, but we're starting to get there. So now what I'm going to do just as a mental note, I'm going to go ahead and set my heading bug to 59 degrees which is ultimately the course we're going to want to follow to Sudbury. So once this comes into the middle, we'll be right on that radial, and assuming we're turned to 59 degrees, it will stay in the middle, although probably a little bit of wind here and there will push us around, although it is a remarkably uh, calm day. I think I have to set the weather set to cold fronts, which is actually one of my favorite uh, weather patterns to fly in here in uh, Prepared or Prepare 3D. Unfortunately, uh, built-in prepared does not have real-world weather, which is the thing I miss the most from X-Plane. Um, so each simulator has like a little something going for it. Uh, FSX has really handy ATC um, and some other like quality of life improvements. I really, really am a huge fan of being able to open a new view, um, like you know, a spot plane view outside, so we can take a look at that, for example. Oh, I should have gotten rid of that little pop-up. <clears throat> um, or even on the same view, I really like going in top-down mode for uh, taxiing around airports. Because again, in real life, you'd sort of have a better ability to kind of look around and get a sense of where you are, not to mention airport maps sort of in your lap. And uh, so that, that's just a way to make that come up. But um, anyway, real-world weather and the ability to bookmark views in X-Plane are really nice. I feel like I was saying something, and I have since forgotten, which is a damn shame. Up ahead, over here, there's a little bit of lumpiness, but it really doesn't do the area justice. These are, um, well, presumably this area here. Let's see. This is the, this would be a little current we're coming up on. 
that is the Great Lacloche Island. And then beyond it would be the Great Lacloche Mountains, um, which are a little bit bigger than this in real life. Um, but not really. You might be wondering, like, why are they really called mountains? Um, and it's because they are some of the oldest mountains in the world. They're two or three billion years old. They are ancient. But because they're so ancient, they've been beaten down. I'm intentionally going a little further to the left so that we can pass over a little current proper. Um, because they are so ancient, we, uh, they, they've just been beaten down by years and years of erosion. And they are not terribly tall. They're also not very pointy. Uh, they're quite rounded and smooth, which I believe is probably why they're known as the La Cloche Mountains. Uh, cloche is the French word, or cloche, the French word for a bell. So it's the Bell Mountains. So they're probably kind of bell-shaped from a certain point of view or something. It is one of the most gorgeous things to ever drive through, especially in the fall when all the leaves have changed colors. It is, uh, it is absolutely breathtaking. It is the most gorgeous thing you may ever see. Uh, really, really nice. That's one of the reasons I like this whole area. I mean, I'm a very... I know, I'm a very tech-oriented person. I like my computer and my internet and all this. Um, but this is the only place in the world where I'm kind of okay to be... Whoa! Wind! What the hell? Nice little shift of wind over here. Uh, I'm kind of okay to be kind of unplugged. I always say this is the one place in the world where I can sit and do absolutely nothing. Just sit on, like, a porch and patio. Maybe sipping a little something. Maybe a book, but I don't even need a book. I can just watch the squirrels play. Actually, not squirrels. Mostly chipmunks. Um... Not very many squirrels in Northern Ontario. Okay, seriously, what happened? All of a sudden, uh, we stopped being a calm day here. Um, over here, what's our altitude? Okay, I believe this would be the proper and true kick-ass bridge here. Um, yeah, this would be, I can't remember what this is called. This would be a little current proper, and this, uh, I'm going to pitch down a bit, hopefully we don't break the plane. Right over here would be the... Um, the sort of main street of town. If you're a European, especially if you're a UK, and you, you're probably familiar with the concept of a uh, of a high street, that is not really something that we have in North America. We don't have high streets. Part of it, I think, is because there's a big car culture as opposed to a pedestrian culture. Um, so in so I have to explain both sides of it. Um, a high street, at my and my familiarity was is with UK. I don't know if it's common everywhere in Europe. Is this sort of like one big street and you're, you're sort of downtown that's very pedestrian friendly oftentimes even cut off from cars where all your shops are so you go to your high street and you get your shopping done um and in north america what you do is you get in your car and you drive to sort of like a strip mall or um, some sort of shop and like a giant shopping mall or uh, a complex with a bunch of big box stores and things like that so um but little current has a little bit of one on its waterfront and there's lots of boats there it's a very popular boating destination uh for people from well all over the place i mean certainly mostly north america because it's not big open water right here uh so it's but you do get a lot of sailboats um and some small yachts and they come and visit and it's it's really cool and every now and again you get a bigger bigger cruise ship i mean we're not talking about um, something like the Queen Mary or anything like that, but bigger. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and fly slightly to the right of my 59 radial here, just to try to center myself, and then I'm going to go back to 59. So yeah, so now we're just departing Manitoulin Island. We're going to go on to the La Cloche Mountain here. Um, or La Cloche Island is what this is. Um... Uh, Oh, I mentioned squirrels. Yeah, squirrels not really a thing. It was always really exciting to me to go to somewhere like Toronto. Well, I'd love going to Toronto for lots of reasons, but um, there you'd see proper squirrels, like big black squirrels. Um, and in the north here, I'm mostly just familiar with chipmunks. Every now and again you see a squirrel, but chipmunks are much more common. Uh, lots of deer on Manitoulin Island, uh, rabbits, that sort of thing. Um, I think there's the occasional bear, maybe, maybe coyotes. Not so much wolves, I don't think, but lots of deer. Um, and in Northern Ontario, you'll see lots of other things. Uh, so, whereas if you were on Manitoulin Island, um, on any given day, kind of no matter where you live on Manitoulin, including in towns, it's entirely possible you might see some deer in your backyard. Um, whereas in uh, Sudbury, while you don't generally see deer in town, although certainly on the outskirts, right in the middle of town, you may occasionally get a bear that wanders in trying to find some food. Easy food from garbage cans, that sort of thing. I just realized one of the things I never did is adjust my fuel mixture. Which, I know below 3,000 feet, you're sort of sort of expected to keep it on full rich, but I, I don't know. I think that's probably more when you're still sort of climbing there. We could probably have leaned out our mixture just a little bit. Not much. I'm not going to fine-tune it with the, uh, the EGT, but we could theoretically save a little bit of fuel and also try to avoid fouling our spark plugs. Although that's probably more of a problem running rich at low RPMs. We are running at around uh, 2,300 here. 
So unlike some of the other planes that I flew in my previous videos, this is a uh, fixed pitch um, propeller. It doesn't have, uh, it's missing one of the levers over here. And you'd have the blue lever in the middle, which would allow you to change the, uh, to sort of set a constant RPM, and then your propeller would actually change its pitch, basically almost like changing gears in the car to keep that RPM steady. So we don't have that, a little bit simpler that way. There we go, let's check the ADF. You can see the ADF needle is telling me that uh, Sudbury is slightly to the right of the uh, the VOR, but part of the issue is, well, first of all, I'm not quite on the signal, and I'm also, apparently, I am legitimately flying a little too far to the left. Let's go ahead and center this, and it'll actually center that needle. Now, the ADF um, antenna is not right at the airport. The one I'm tuned to is about six miles off the airport. So as we get in very close to the airport, obviously this will uh, not not be the sort of thing we follow, but it's great for general navigation, and some of the ADF towers have gargantuan range. It's also pretty, like, brainless. What you can do if you're flying longer distances, is you just, like, sort of write down your sequence of ADF towers that you're going to tune to, and you just keep changing them, and you just keep following the arrow. And then that's how you mostly get places. There are a few places in the world where there's certainly no radio stations to tune into at all. And again, there was sort of that awkward bit at the start of our flight where I was just, just flying east until we caught something. Um, because if I bring up my map, at least the, uh, the site that I'm using here, the Sky Vector site, which is great, I, uh, there's no indicator about any ADFs here as far as I can tell. I might not know all the symbols, though it's entirely possible. I like how the windmills are shown here. They're not in-game, uh, which is too bad, but uh, recently, in the last couple of years, um, several windmills... Oh, that's how you get the defroster. It's hidden right behind. Oh, excellent. Okay. Um, uh, several windmills, big windmills, have been set up, or wind turbines, I guess you could say, have been set up on Manitoulin Island. Some people don't like them. They don't like the look of them. Um, I mean, it's it's tough because, in a sense, they're actually quite nice. White, clean, kind of elegant, and very kind of futury. But I can understand in a sort of rustic place like Manitoulin that's got that sort of very country charm, it might not be good. Oh, there's a, there's a truck or something on the road down there. Look at that. And a car stuck behind it. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, it's nice to fly above all that. Oh, I should mention, the actual drive from um, from Gore Bay to Sudbury, or vice versa, would probably be about two hours in a car. It's about an hour and a half from Sudbury to Little Current, which is normally where I go. Um, depends on traffic, weather, and how much you follow the speed limit. Do -do -do. And certainly, if you get uh, stuck behind a big truck, a big lorry, um, in the Lacloche Mountains, which are very hilly and twisty and turny as you try to drive through them, uh, you'll be going quite slowly there. Also note that speed limits in North America tend to be a little bit lower than the uh, speed limits, and we're just below 2,000 feet, I just realized, so I should probably pitch up just a little more. I'm, I'm still pretty bad at getting, like, very precise level flight. Um, yeah, they tend to be a little bit lower than the ones in Europe, whereas, uh, so on, like, a giant highway, multi-lane, you know, um, just big major highway, the speed limit in Canada, the highest one you'll ever see is 100 kilometers an hour. Whereas I know in Europe they could go beyond that. I mean, and of course there's, you know, the places where there might not be any speed limits whatsoever. Um, in Europe. Like some sections of the Autobahn apparently don't have any speed limits. Although, some people keep saying it's not like quite... It's more speed limited than you might imagine. Um, you're almost level. We do have a bit of terrain coming up over there, so it might actually do me to pitch up a little bit, get a tiny bit of vertical climb, just to make sure. I mean, we've got plenty of room, but let's go ahead and, and just be sure. So yeah, so, uh, but on a standard sort of two-lane um, sort of major highway, like a big part of the Trans-Canada hi Highway, despite being the one highway that connects all of Canada, a lot of places just two lanes, which is one lane going one direction, one lane going the other direction. Um, the speed limit there will generally be 80 which is also not too terribly high. And that's in kilometers, so in miles, 100 kilometers an hour or 60 miles an hour. So the 80s are what, like more of a 45 speed limit? Maybe 50? Probably 50 is closer to that. Don't math on live TV, kids. It'll never work out. I think uh, 80 kilometers an hour is uh, 12, 12 miles an hour. That's, yeah, something like that. Anywho, we are basically on course over here. If we do check out... Now, if I wanted to, I could punch in uh, the um, the airport on the GPS over here and get some very precise uh, measurements in terms of where we are, where we should go, and how far away we are. But because I'm turned into a, a nav station that's got a DME, 
I, I don't even know what it stands for. Distance something something. Um, down here, I can get some information. I can find out, for example, I'm 46 miles away from the, uh, the nav beacon over in Sudbury. That does not look like that farm should be there. But maybe. Um, and, you know, and descending. And effectively, our rate of uh, speed, our ground speed towards that station is, it'll fluctuate around because we're not literally flying directly towards it. We're at a slight angle. If I were going at 90 degrees, it would tell me I'd have an effective speed of zero. Um, and uh, the next number is how long it'll take us to get there. Right now it's figuring about 24 minutes. And again, that'll vary depending on how straight exactly I'm going. Um, should be noticed that this is just a, uh, a nav beacon. It's not technically right on the runway, and if I follow this and I line up to the runway, at some point it will it will not line up exactly where the runway is, and certainly, I mean, not on the 59 degree uh, radial either. But, um, but there is an ILS at one of the runways in Sudbury. It's not likely to be the one we'll be directed to. Assuming the wind in Sudbury is the same as it was in Gore Bay, which I think was 310, so... And I always get this wrong. <laughs> But the wind direction is where the wind is coming from. So if we were flying at a 310, so sort of northwestish, then the wind would be right in our face. Now that was the situation in Gore Bay. It's probably similar in Sudbury because we're not that far away, but it might be slightly different. And in any case, um, the active runway at any given time is going to be the one that faces into the wind as much as possible. And the reason for that is pretty obvious if you think about it. You might think, well, if the wind's from behind, then it gives you a push and you go faster. But the deal is, if the wind is blowing into you, imagine you're standing still and the wind's blowing into your face at 10 knots. Well, yeah, you're standing still on the ground, but in terms of an airplane, an airplane cares about the speed of the wind over the wings, right? And so just by standing still, it's already as if the airplane was moving at 10 knots. So you get free speed if you take off into the wind. Um, and the stronger the wind, the more free speed you get. In fact, it's entirely conceivable that if the wind were strong enough, you could actually take off while standing still on the ground. You might even get blown backwards. But still conceivably, assuming that your propeller was chopping forward through the air, you could climb. You could, you know, if you're at indicated airspeed, so I can climb, let's say my climb rate that I want to get is 80 knots. Well, if I were technically flying into a wind at 80 knots directly into my face in the air with the propeller going properly, and my indicated airspeed were 80, I would be standing still compared to the ground, but I could be climbing. I, I wouldn't have to be sinking. So anyway, that's the advantage. And also the same with landings, then the wind is also sort of slowing you down. Your plane, once you get below a certain speed, your plane will stall. I believe the green area where it cuts out, this is your sort of stall speed with, I think, no flaps. I might be wrong, though. Um, and, and so you will stall if you go too slow. But you want to go relatively slow compared to the ground so you don't smash into it and burn off all your, your tires too fast. Um, and so landing into the wind makes, you, makes it so you've got enough air speed to keep you aloft, but you can have a bit more of a gentle landing. So that's the logic there. So that's why every runway you can land from either end, but it depends on the wind. So most likely, and I'm trying to remember, I've got my chart up over here. So the Sudbury Airport has two actual runways. It has the 4 slash 22 runway and the 12 slash 30 runway. So the 30 runway is the runway that faces basically roughly 300 on the compass. So I suspect we will be directed, assuming the wind's the same in Sudbury, we will probably, I'm, I'm expecting the 30 runway to be the active one. It's a little bit shorter than the, uh, the 4 slash 22, and the 4 slash 22 is also the one with an ILS. But given the fact that we are on a VFOR flight on a tiny little Cessna 172, I'm pretty sure we'll be directed to the 30. Which means as we approach the airport, we're actually going to want to be to the east of it. Because we're coming in from the south and we'll be landing northwest. So ideally, we'll be southeast of the airport and then we'll be able to turn directly northwest and we'll be perfectly lined up with the, uh, the airport. We're a little bit away from that still. This area over here, um, assuming I'm remembering where we are properly, well, we're not quite where I was thinking, but still, um, is an area that uh, is made semi-famous. It's by a um, so-called group of seven painters, very famous Canadian painters who, uh, there are seven of them, who went, well, I think there was like, there may have been like a member exchange at some point, there might have been like eight dudes technically at some point or something, I don't remember, but anyway. These seven painters who went all over Canada and painted lots of Canadiana stuff and really actually helped develop a lot of Canadian identity as a result. And um, 
this area, the North Shore and the French River area and things like that, if you ever go there and if you're familiar with their paintings, you will see many, many sites that look like they're right out of those paintings. A lot of sort of those windswept um, softwood trees, right, like pine trees or cedars or something like that um, on rocky, rocky terrain. One of the, uh, the things that Canada has is actually a really uh, strong softwood export industry. Um, and the reason is our softwood is actually a little bit harder than the average softwood. So there's hardwood and there's softwood, and you use them for different things, right? Like for a lot of furniture, I think you use hardwood, um, which is very, very hard. And for a lot of construction, you use softwood because softwood trees grow a lot faster. Um, and I mean, when you've got a two by four, you don't need to be like as hard as oak. You just need it to provide some structure. You actually want it to be light enough to ship, light enough so that you can drive hammer, <laughs> drive nails into it, for example. But uh, by virtue of the fact that the terrain here is quite scrappy and tough, the softwood trees that grow here grow a little bit slower and a little bit stronger. And so this is one of the reasons that it's actually relatively prized for certain activities. Um, plus, it turns out Canada is just really big and has a hell of a lot of trees. So, you know, that helps. Although we do like to cut them down. <laughs> we have lots of trees. Let's cut them down. As we approach Sudbury, I will give you a couple of notes about the town itself. Oh, you can see I'm... I'm off the radio a little bit, but I'm still generally going in the right direction. Um, well, I'm going in the right, I've got the right heading, but I'm actually going a little too far to the left, and you can see here I'm being, or I'm going too far to the right. Sudbury's going to be over there, and we're going to be over here. So, whoa, that is not actually me turning, that is the wind bumping us about a bit. Happens to be blowing us in roughly the right direction. Yeah, I'm really curious, we don't uh, have access to Sudbury yet, no? No. We never did tune into. to, um, Toronto Center to have a track our flight. Uh, might be a good idea to tune in now and see what our altimeter should be. Because so I think they'll update us on the setting. Toronto Most likely Center, it's the same air pressure. So, we're going to set our transponder here to 5025. Apparently it's been on this whole time at 1200, which is not really ideal. Now they can see us on the radar. Altimeter. I think it's telling us where our altimeter should be as opposed to what it is. I'm pretty sure that's true. Hopefully it's true. I'm pretty sure that's the case, though. So, our altimeter, the way the, the altimeter works is it measures air pressure. Because as you go up into the... Um, As you go up into the air, the air pressure goes down, so it's able to use that to measure your effective altitude. Um, and because air pressure can vary depending on weather, right? Low pressure systems tend to be associated with like rain and thunderstorms, that sort of thing. You have to tune or set your altimeter to the right barometric pressure so that um, it measures the, the altitude correctly. What's interesting about this plane, the uh, A2A Cessna, uh, is it's got you have to set the um, the autopilot um, barometer separately. You have to, they're not linked, so you have to make sure to update both so that it's flying at the correct altitude based on its own systems, which is kind of a neat thing. So we're currently uh, cruising around at uh, about 200 and, or 2,250 feet. Again, slightly higher than I'd, I'd ballpark, but we're nice and level, and I'm pretty happy with it overall. Things are relatively good. I suspect that this is the uh, city of Greater Sudbury over here. There's Sudbury proper, and then there was a bunch of communities outside of Sudbury. They were amalgamated, oh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago now. Probably something around 15 years ago into Greater Sudbury. Um, just one mayor and a variety of councillors and one city council. We're getting very close to the airport. I was going to say, we must be able to reach it. So let's get a, a wind report here. Okay, so the wind's basically the same, about 10 knots at uh, 312, so again, northwesterly kind of uh, in-your-face wind. If you're facing northwest, the wind will be in your face. Um, oh, if we'd listened, we probably would have been found out what the uh, active runway is, but we'll request a full stop landing. Okay, we're on the radio again, so I'll turn to the 5-9. Okay, 
So I've been practicing my um, traffic pattern flying. So what they're telling me here, it says make left downwind. I was very confused the first time I heard this. I'm like, if I turn left, I'm going to be going upwind. I don't understand. But they're telling me that the pattern flow at the airport is left. Basically, there's like an oval or, or it's actually a rectangle um, with one, the, one of the longer sides of the rectangle being kind of the runway. And so the pattern is flying in a square above that. And basically, just like NASCAR, you go around the pattern making left turns. So it's a counterclockwise pattern. And I'm pretty sure that's what they're telling me. They're saying make left downwind for runway 30. So if I go ahead and turn my heading knob, oops, I don't have the focus set right. I set this to 30. Now the actual, um, the actual runway may not be exactly 300 on the compass. It uh, it can be off by a little bit. I can get that information um, from my GPS. It's got that information in there, but I'll, I'll leave it out for now. Um, so it means that to enter the uh, the downwind portion. So you'd land upwind, so the downwind portion is actually in the opposite direction. So I'll be making a right turn into the downward portion to get it to enter left traffic. But I don't have to do that yet because I can't actually see the airport yet. If you take a look, we are still um, 25 nautical miles away from the airport. I'm going to keep flying roughly towards it. I'm no longer flying towards the ADF because the ADF is not right at the airport. I'm going to try to stay on my radial though. And certainly I've drifted a little far. Lots of industry in Sudbury. Oh, that's right. I was going to talk about this, and then I remembered I had to tune some radios and things. Um, Sudbury is a very mining-oriented town. It literally exists in a crater. I don't know, a billion years ago, or however long it was, a giant uh, meteorite struck Sudbury, leaving a massive crater. Um, it's not, you know, it's not particular like, steep. You'd be hard-pressed. If you're just going around Sudbury, you wouldn't be aware of it. But if you look at sort of topographical maps, you realize that Sudbury's in a crater. Um... And this is a very rich nickel-bearing... I love the uh, the shadows of the clouds over there. Look at that. Uh, nickel-bearing meteorite. And Sudbury is, and has been for a very long time, the biggest nickel producer in the entire world. Uh, so lots of mining over here. And we can actually see, in fact, Sudbury, famously or infamously, has a giant smokestack that uh, oversees the... Um, um, the what am I looking for? Horizon, cityscape, landscape. There's a word I'm looking for, and I'm, it's not hitting me. But you can basically see this giant smokestack everywhere. It's not its not pretty, but it's there. And that's a, that's a half-decent representation of it. Not really. It was for a long time uh, one of the tallest freestanding structures um, there. I think CN Tower beat it. I don't know. There, there's, there was some sort of height record there, and it's a very tall smokestack. Um, because the, um, the mining was producing a lot of pollution. So their solution to the pollution, uh, was to simply build a, a smoke stack that was so high that the pollution w went somewhere else. No, really. Um, and yet, that was much, much better than uh, what it was before, because the way it used to work, like, turn of the century, was, um, and I'm talking about, like, so the early 1900s, was these giant open pit roasters. So what they had to do is they dug up all the ore, they, and then they cut down all the trees. Uh, Sudbury, for a long time, was like a desolate wasteland, and it... it the acid rain from all the pollution I'm about to tell you was part of the problem, but really the, the root cause was actually that we cut down all the trees and we created these giant roasting beds with like huge, like we're talking about like football field size, big pits that were dug out filled with thousands upon thousands of trees basically. All the ore was thrown in there, the whole thing was lit up and would burn for weeks or months. Um, and that would be how um, the, the ore was like broken up and smelted down and, and separated. And there's a lot of sulfur content in this ore. So not only did we cut down all the trees to do this, then we were releasing tons of sulfur into the air, forming sulfur, sulfuric acid, acid rain. And um, yeah, I'm not facing the airport. I got to fix this up a little bit here. And so for a long time, A, there was no trees anywhere in the area, but all the, the rock that was exposed was blackened. It was literally like black, black rock from all the acid rain. Um, and uh, it was a pretty terrible landscape. Uh, there's one of the common jokes is it was so bad that the Apollo astronauts in the 60s came to train here because it was so much like a lunar surface. Now, that is technically true, uh, which is the best kind of truth, but the, the real reason that they came here, and they did, was because of the uh, meteorite impact site. They were, um, they were learning geology that would be useful on the moon. 
uh, when examining like lunar craters and, and meteorite sites and things like that, because there's distinctive um, sort of patterns in rock that happens when a meteorite strikes. And that's the sort of thing that we're learning about. It was not about like walking around on the lunar surface or anything, because honestly, um, it, it wouldn't help here. It works better if they were in like a pseudo low G environment, you know, like on tethers and things like that. So they were a little bit anti-gravity. So they weren't here to learn how to walk around on the moon. They were here to learn about moon rocks. But it still looked like garbage. Now, nowadays, because about 20 years ago, a giant regreening effort started in Sudbury. And sometimes we, we pat ourselves on the back or the, the people behind that pat themselves on the back about how good of a job they did. But of course, they wouldn't have had to do this job in the first place if we hadn't just destroyed the environment uh, so completely. How far are we away? 17 nautical miles. We should just about start to see something. It should be... So we're left of... We're, the radial's to the left of us, and I'm trying to intercept that still, although I really don't need to do that anymore. Tell you what, let's just tune this so that we know sort of where we are. So if we go to a 56, so if we're flying on a 56, we'll be flying more or less towards the airport now. And the ADIF is still not totally gone. The airport's going to be somewhere over there-ish. Anyway, um, so we pat ourselves on the back because we did this massive re green effort that was like insane um, because it was bare black rock everywhere. So it was like multiple phases of like the sort of sticky pseudo topsoil was applied so that some things could take root again massive planting effort of trees but now if you come to Sudbury yeah all the trees are pretty young and small still but it's green trees all over the place and it really does look like a completely different uh, uh, landscape which is pretty impressive I'm just gonna go ahead and see if I can't slowly descend a little bit more if we cheat and look at the GPS we can see where the airport is on there but I'm going to keep trying to use the uh, instruments to more or less fly in the right direction. I'm going a little too far to the left now. Let's go ahead and swing over. And just try to maintain that. Once we have visual contact with the airport, we'll go ahead and enter that traffic pattern. Basically, we're going to fly towards the airport. Um, try to get to the right level. About a thousand feet above the uh, ground is the traffic pattern level, generally speaking. Um, and then we're going to make a right turn parallel to the, uh, to the runway, fly out a little bit, and make a left turn, and another left turn, and hopefully line right up to the, uh, the, the runway. Now, most likely, on that second left turn, I won't quite line up properly, and the reason is, uh, it's really difficult for me to look out the window and keep an eye on exactly where, where the, uh, the airport is, um, because, unless I sort of manually hit the button to sort of scooch down what I have to do to sort of see things is I sort of have to tilt up a little like that to get past the uh, the window edge and then I'm no longer kind of going straight and all kinds of stuff looks like we're, we're probably flying over the center of Sudbury right now I suspect that this might be Lake Ramsey I'm not sure oh, big building over there my auto gen of buildings is a little bit lower that's why there's not buildings everywhere just a, a smattering to give a hint um, I'm not sure Lake Ramsey though if this is Lake Ramsey wherever Lake Ramsey is has the distinction of being the largest lake entirely contained within a city in the world. Lots of water. I think the Sudbury region by itself has about 100 lakes within it. Um, and keep in mind, this is a city of a population of about 150,000 people, which is not very big. However, it is very, very spread out. You cannot live in, uh, in Sudbury without uh, owning a vehicle, really, for all practical purposes. Yeah, you can maybe make do with public transit, but um, public transit in a lot of places, other than like, you know, major centers like somewhere like Toronto or Ottawa, is just not going to be very good in Canada. Because again, a big part of it, we have so much space. We have so much space, so people live further apart, so they need cars. And since everyone has cars, we build further apart. So we need cars. So everything gets built further apart because everyone has a car and so on and so forth. It's like a self-defeating thing. We will, Sudbury, I would love to see it become a pedestrian friendly city or a bicycling friendly city, but it, it's a chicken and the egg problem where nothing is coming first kind of thing. Um, I am not on my radio. I'm not doing a very good job here. Not in the least. Let's actually follow the ADF for a little bit. Oh, I see the lights. There we go. Way over there. You see that little red glow? Let me zoom in. Boop, 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 boop. Oh, it disappeared. But, no, it's there. It's just hard to see. There's a little bit of haze in the distance. There we go. There's the airport. 
Uh, at one time, I did have the mod loaded for the Sudbury Airport proper, but I, um... I took it out. I actually reset all my mods at some point because I just wanted to have things be a little bit cleaner. Okay. So, once we get there... Oh, okay, we already have our thingy set for the 30. So, once I get close, I'm going to enter that downwing leg by making a right turn, and I'll be facing 120 degrees, which is exactly opposite of the, um, of the runway. I should start descending now, about 1,000 feet. So if I was worried, I could always request that I could land on uh, runway 22 and use ILS because it makes it into much, much easier mode. Pull back on the throttle a little just to dip. Now I'm feeling like I have to apply a little bit of back pressure to arrest this up to about 500 feet per minute. Yeah, so let's go ahead, especially as we gain speed. As we go down, we'll gain speed. And then it'll go up again. And it's kind of hard to be consistent. So I don't know if I'll trim for this descent. I might I might keep a little pressure on here. I feel like I was in the middle of another story that got interrupted, but I'm not entirely sure. We're going to be passing under a cloud. I do like the cloud shadows. Apparently I have to turn on my uh, air airplane shadow again. Actually helps with the landing, especially if uh, the sun is behind you, because you can see your own shadow, and that makes it life a lot easier. That's one of the other things um, in the flight sim, because we don't have, um, like, true 3D vision in here, right? We have two eyes in real life, and with that, you can judge the distance of things. Whereas if you only have, like, one eye, like, if you if you cover your eye, or you literally just have one eye, I suppose, um, or you're playing a game like this, there's no true sense of distance. You're sort of having to guess based on, like, the size of objects in, in the distance, but when you're trying to approach flat ground, you can't really see how far you are. Um, if I was playing this with something like an Oculus Rift or something, then that wouldn't be a problem. But I find it really hard on landings to really judge how far above the ground we are in the flight sim. One thing that's nice about uh, piloting the big, big jets in the flight sim, I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm going to go ahead and make my right turn. Actually, I could probably just get on my, what is it called, the base? Final? Oh, I don't remember the names anymore. Um, let me go ahead and give one level of flaps. I can just go in for the landing. I can make a right turn here, sort of enter the base part of the pattern, and then make the left for the uh, the final approach. We already have our landing intentions as we uh, come in here. They should go and uh, and okay me. I think that'll be fine. So we are going to be going. So right now we're going away. So if I want a 90 degree from 300, I'm going to be flying at about a 30. Let's go to the 30, or the 3, on my gyro, which I realize I haven't uh, synced up to my magnetic compass. And I do have gyro drift turned on. Hopefully it's okay. We are currently at an altitude of 2,000, so we're still definitely too high. Oh! I'm looking at the wrong runway. Herp derp I'm lining up for the, uh, the 22. So it's definitely time for me to make my right turn. So I'm landing at the one that goes this way. So, okay, good. That's why I was a little bit confused about the progression of things. So now I'm going to turn onto my downwing leg. Let me go ahead and throttle up again. We're going way too slow. Although I still have one level of flaps. It's probably okay to keep that as I try to uh, descend. Flaps will help me bleed off a little bit of speed and then drop down. So we're going to be going on a 1-2. So now we're on our downwind. The wind is behind us. And we are going parallel to the runway. We're probably a little bit further than uh, you might like. There we go. And this is the situation where I would really like to uh, have the quick set cameras. Um, and just to be able to toggle back and forth between them as well. Oh, we're climbing. That's not good. Um, uh, just to be able to... Let me get rid of the flaps. We are going to have to fly a little bit forward. Um, yeah, just be able to hit a button and quick look to the left and then let go and then pop back to the front view or hit another hotkey for the front view and just keep quickly toggling between those two. Alright. Thank you very much. That's great. So the airstrip is ours. Again, and here I can't see the airport, right? So I've got to do kind of one of those. 
which is actually turning my plane a little bit. Then I got to slowly move up to the front again. And so this is just a, a sim workflow thing that I, I got to work out. There are some ways to do some hotkeys. I think there's a plugin as well, but I don't think it's free, which is kind of annoying to me. It's like, all I want is to be able to set hotkeys, which I can do in X-Plane. All right, so is it about 45 degrees away from us? I'm going to say yes. Whoa, other way, other way. All right. So now we're going to be turning left. And we are still too high. I'm going to be turning left to about a 30 degrees. So the three on the gyro this is what I started doing last time. And then when I realized I was looking at the wrong, uh, the wrong run runway. Now I can go all the way to full rich at this point. Pop out a flap once more. I'm not banking enough. I got to make sharper turns. I'm like turning this into a like an oval instead of a rectangle, which is not quite what I'm looking for. Still too high. Aimed right, so we're gonna drop relatively quickly here, which will also build up some speed. That's good. Oops. Oh, keep keep dropping. Keep going down. And again, here is where I really need to make sure that I don't overshoot the, um, the airfield, the runway, which is usually what happens. Or I undershoot. I make the left turn. It's like, nope, got to go further. Or I make the left turn. I'm like, oh, I'm way past. Just because it's very difficult to see, especially as I'm trying to descend and not, say, crash at the same time. All those things would be really nice. Now, if I want an extra degree of security, actually, that makes no sense. I was going to say, I can flip over. I do have the um, the ILS programmed in, which if I do turn, I wonder if I'll get the glide scope, which will tell me if I'm too high or not. I don't know if that would technically work here because I'm not actually lined up for the um, the actual runway 22 slash 4, which is what the ILS is there for. All right, I'm going too slow. Although I do still need to go down. So you know what? Rather than throttle down, I'm just going to nose down a bit more. I'm at 1,500 feet. Um, although, again, I haven't checked. What is the elevation of this airport? I should have that information. Oh, it's, this airport's at 1,100 feet above sea level. So actually, right now, I'm just over 1,000 feet from the surface. So I'm actually okay. I mean, kind of derpy. So let's go ahead and throttle up then. And try to spot the airport. There it is. Okay, we are very nearly aligned. I'll go ahead and make the turn. Most likely, I'll have to make some S turns and adjustments and things like that. Just because it's hard to spot, but let's go ahead and we're gonna go ahead and bank. Keep the throttle a little bit more reasonable. Approach speed is supposed to be somewhere between 70 and 95. Oh, I don't remember. I've, I've got this little cheat sheet or set of notes over here I can reference. We're gonna be okay. All right, so we're mostly lined up, and yeah, we are too low. Well, at this distance, it's fine. We we will have to be at this height at some point, but not quite yet. So let me try to fly a little bit level at this point. I'm actually going up. And losing speed. So yeah, this is not quite right. Ideally, that left turn will end with us perfectly aligned to the runway. But here we'll have to keep flying a little like this. Actually, I suspect we might be slightly too far to the right. No, nope, we actually have to go slightly more to the right. We are almost aligned at this point. Currently doing 80 knots. Which is fine. You can see the glide scope over here. The uh, vertical arrow, or the, the, one, the one that goes... This one, the one that should go up and down, but is actually your horizontal portion, uh, will not be right because it's on a completely different uh, airfield. But the glide scope, no, the glide scope probably won't make sense. But these lights are what we're actually going to be looking at. We want two reds, two whites. That will show us that we're all right. I am going way too fast, though. Let me go throttle back, and once we drop into that second white area, I will be okay to deploy my second level of flaps. You can also use it to slow myself down. Try to line up. So we are basically into the wind, which is perfect. Slightly to an angle. It's hitting us slightly from the right. Um, but it is a light wind. It's only 10 knots, so that's not too bad. Oh, that's water up there. It looks like a giant like pit or wormhole. We are too high. We've got two whites. Two whites, high as a kite. Two reds, or four reds, rather. You're already dead. Because technically those are four lights. There are four lights! But 
it looks like two banks of that. So let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and deploy the. What the hell? This is a giant like division by zero hole. All right. Oh, I bet you the uh, my elevation data for this airport ain't quite right, but there we go. That's life. Too high, too fast, excellent, very standard. All right, we got 30 degree flaps. Go ahead and throttle back, throttle back, throttle back. I think we can go all the way down to idle at this point. Lead off the speed. Luckily, these little planes are pretty goddamn forgiving. That's the sweet spot, although we'll soon be passing the lights. So let's cut all that. And actually, often like to have a pop-up window here for the uh, external view, because it can help give me a little bit more of an idea about how high I am. Exit runway, when able. Exit runway when able. Now, if I remember correctly at this airport, what I want to do is actually turn onto runway 22. Maybe the other way. See, this is why an airport map. Roger. Because if I keep going down this runway, it doesn't actually, uh, there's no taxis, no taxiways there. So there's a taxiway off runway 4 slash 22, or I can make a UE and get off the taxiway over there, but it seems a little bit silly that I should be going the wrong way on the active runway. I don't know if this makes sense either, but continuing down runway that I landed on will get me nowhere, so I'm going to have to make a, a 180 anyway. Now, what I hate is as part of that 180, the ATC is like, oh, you're off the runway, good, excellent job. And I'm like, no, I am I just stepped off for a tiny second, but I have not officially cleared the uh, runway. Anyway, we'll tune uh, the ground, request taxi to parking. There should be a taxi over here. I don't think I'm dreaming. Yeah, you see what I mean? If we kept going down that way, we'd just be stuck and be like, hold on, no one else land. I got to make this long ass trip over here. Um, I guess it would have been shorter from this intersection to just go and pop over to this uh, taxiway. But hopefully 4 slash 22 is not in use. Oh, yeah. Taxiway B. Flaps up all the way, which I failed to do earlier. We're going to turn off our nav lights. We don't have the strobe on. Keep the taxi lights on. Keep the beacon on, which the beacon's got to be on all the time. Uh, yellow sign is my taxiway over there. A little fast. Throttling down. We might bleed off enough speed without having to brake too hard. Although I'll use the diff braking to turn maybe a little bit more sharply. Last thing I want to do is flip my plane, which I've done a lot on the ground. Especially probably with the winds, because there is a procedure that you're supposed to do when you're on the ground, depending on how you're facing the wind or whatnot, um, in terms of your your elevators and ailerons, I think. To basically counter the fact that if you have a strong wind on the ground, it could flip you over by itself. But um, I have the dumb, and I don't know how to do that. So we can basically, at this point, end the flight, call it done. Um, I don't know exactly where the parking is supposed to be. I suppose I can turn on the progressive taxi. It just told me taxiway B, which I think I popped off on. I keep following the yellow lights. Progressive taxi is on, but I'm... No, oh, there he goes. Let's say, but I'm not being progressively taxied anywhere. I think that it's possible, like in the real Sudbury airport, unless I'm wrong, over here on the right is where the general aviation parking is. Um, and then they've got a big hangar here, which I think is relatively realistic. And then you've got the actual sort of terminal over there. Now, this is not the actual terminal graphics, so it doesn't look quite right. Um, but they're actually going to have me park in the wrong place, I think. I, and there may be some more general aviation parking over there. In any case, I won't uh, bother you guys with uh, that. Tell you what, we're going to park here because we can. Get the brakes. Apply the parking brake. We'll uh, turn off the avionics. You want to have the avionics off before you start or stop the airplane um, because, turn off the pitted heat as well, uh, because sometimes you will get some um, power surges from starting and stopping. All right, so we pulled out the gas there. 
And, uh, well, since we're just parking in place, turn off the key, turn off the batteries, turn off the beacon, uh, turn off the GPS, which actually has its own battery in this simulator. I don't know why I can't click on the, uh, the control lock from here. Oh, I forgot to show you the cool stuff about the sound in this game, in this, uh, plane. Like, you open and close the window, it changes the sound volumes effectively, but also, by putting this on, you put your, your, uh, headphones on, and actually, you can see it, if I go to a lock spot over here you can see my pilot here has the earphones on so i can toggle those off and the sunglasses as well and that's the same as clicking on the thing inside there i can also add uh more passengers it's kind of a neat little thing and the weight distribution in the plane is actually like is simulated same thing with the uh, the fuel any baggage in the back in fact depending on a few different factors. If we watch the uh, the back of the plane, let me turn this way. And then do this. If I put some baggages in the back, you might see the tail drop. Oh, not quite. Sometimes you do. Depends on stuff. But uh, it's quite interesting that it does actually take all the weights into consideration. It's also got this cool thing we can uh, uh, tie down wheel chokes or chocks, I suppose. Put the pitted cover on. The pitted cover is the thing that if you forget to take off before you fly, you have no airspeed indicator, but this keeps it nice and clean. We can uh, open the doors and empty the plane. Like, such great little detail, just fantastic. Anyway, so yeah, we're going to park right here on the taxiway because uh, we can, because we rule the world. I mean, literally, this world exists for our purposes and revolves around us so um i hope you enjoyed this flight i hope you enjoyed the sort of geography stuff um i'm gonna try to come up with more things like this in the future yeah and the problem is some of my best scenery that i've got is for europe and i don't really know i can tell you these sorts of stories about some of these areas um maybe maybe in ayrshire in scotland that's about the best i could do but uh that brings this video to a wrap if you do like it make sure to uh to let me know in the comments and also with a like is always good if you're new to my channel, I usually do uh, simulation games, not uh, flight sims so much. I do strategy and simulations, tycoony kind of things, but uh, you might want to subscribe. Who knows? Maybe you'll find something you enjoy. See you next time, folks. Bye-bye.